Hello everyone and welcome to Live 1000 Years. I'm your host Brent Jordan. I'm also the author of the book. Today we're going to be reading from chapter 3 uh, entitled Money and the article can be found on page 162. It's called The Cost of Money. So let's get started. One day during the tumultuous 2008 year I so happened to step inside a Barnes & Noble bookstore for no particular reason and suddenly caught a glimpse of my future staring right at me from the bookshelf. I repeated the catchy title of the book over and over again in my mind, Your Money or Your Life. I examined the table of contents and fanned through the pages. The ghost of Henry David Thoreau spoke over my shoulder. The cost of a thing is the amount of what I will call life which is required to be exchanged for it, immediately or in the long run. I read the book over three consecutive nights while highlighting the most important points. Similar to the 1960s and the 1980s, your money or your life transformed my entire relationship with money. This single book changed all of my life values and beliefs about money. As a result of the book's instructions, I drafted a personal outline of my future game plan with money. I hope after today you'll do the same. According to the book, our personal relationship with money encompasses our earnings, spending, debt, savings, and how much time they occupy in our lives. Our relationship with money also shows us how much personal satisfaction and fulfillment we get from our family, community, and the planet Earth. Once we change our relationship with money by means of a nine-step plan outlined in the book, we can achieve a new and improved level of consciousness, health, comfort, and confidence about money, about our lives, and about the planet Earth itself. The book begins by showing us the difference between the old roadmap and the new roadmap about money. The old roadmap trapped us in the very place it was supposed to liberate us from. Examples of the old roadmap include 9 to 5 till we're 65, owe your soul to the company store, and striving forever for a higher standard of living regardless of personal, social, spiritual, and world consequences. For many decades, the old roadmap delivered the goods, but only so long as we needed it and wanted more material possessions. While at work, people identified with their jobs. While not at work, people became consumers who purchased material possessions. The word consume means to destroy, squander, use up. People considered shopping a recreational sport. They shopped till they dropped. People also wanted a better future for their children, so they worked even harder and often became a two-income family whose nannies or daycare centers replaced home parenting. People bought their children the newest toys and luxuries because they felt guilty about abandoning their children all day long and because they wanted to prove their love for their children. People began spending so much time earning money to buy material possessions for themselves and their families that they no longer took time to examine their personal, social, spiritual, and world priorities. In the end, instead of making people more healthy, happy, and independent, the old roadmap made them more financially dependent. From birth to death, people had become financially dependent. First, people became dependent upon their parents for financial security, then upon the business economy to get them a good job, then upon their jobs for financial survival, and possibly upon the state and federal unemployment handouts to sustain themselves between jobs, and finally upon the retirement pension and 401k plans and Medicare benefits before they died. In a nutshell, the material progress that was supposed to free people only enslaved them. A tipping point eventually occurred at the height of the old roadmap way of living. Personal conditions dramatically changed. For many affluent people, material possessions went from fulfilling their life needs to enhancing comfort to facilitating luxury, and then beyond luxury to outright excess. $2,500 purses and $1,500 business suits, $500 blouses and shirts and shoes, heated bathroom floors and toilet seats, granite kitchen countertops, stainless steel kitchen appliances, Viking kitchen stoves, French hardwood floors, Egyptian 1,500 thread count bed seats. 
silk pillowcases, $100,000 German driving machines, and 10,000 square foot homes with two or three air conditioners and heating units and elevators. At the same time, adverse global issues emerged could, that could not be solved by simply providing more material goods. The entire planet Earth showed signs of nearing its capacity to handle the economic growth and consumerism. Air pollution, water shortages, global warming, ozone holes, natural resource degradation and depletion, rainforest irradiation, trash builds up, strip mining, fracking, and species extinction. All these personal and global issues questioned our very survival on Earth. But according to the book, there's still hope. The old roadmap can be replaced with a new roadmap. Your money or your life shows us how to create this new roadmap. The book recommends a nine-step plan that will ensure our global survival, as well as our personal health, <coughs> happiness, prosperity, and peace of mind. Here's the plan. Step number one, make peace with your past. Add up all the money you've earned in your entire life and then calculate how much money and assets you have today. Look closely at how much money you held on to and how much money you spent. For most people, this calculation yields a very unpleasant surprise, but that's all right. There's no sense in beating up yourself over the past mistakes. Step number two, figure out your real earnings and spending. Add up your monthly income after federal and state taxes and then subtract all of your monthly work-related expenses such as purchasing special clothes and dry cleaning costs, automobile services and repairs, and insurance and gasoline, parking costs, lunches, housekeepers, daycares, and medications and other medical charges due to your work stress and illness given to us by other employees. Number three, create monthly reports. Keep track of all your income and spending each month. Break this income and spending down into categories and then convert the monetary amounts into your real hourly pay, or as the book calls it, hours of life energy spent. Step number four, ask yourself three questions. For each of the categories listed above, did I receive personal fulfillment in proportion to the hours of energy I expended? Is this expenditure in alignment with my personal health and ultimate life purpose? How might this expenditure change if I didn't have to work for a living? In other words, would this expenditure be more, less, or the same if I stopped working at my job? Step number five, maintain a written graph of income and expenses. Keep your monthly graph available for personal viewing. Number six, learn to value your life energy by minimizing spending. Number seven, maximize your earnings. Adopt and maintain a positive attitude about money. Accept 100% responsibility for your life and work. Number eight step, watch for the crossover point. The crossover point is when your monthly annual portfolio and passive income from your investments such as stocks, bonds, real estates, copyrights equals or exceeds your monthly or annual expenses. Finally, number nine, safely manage your money. Become knowledgeable about financial strategies and vehicles for your portfolio and passive income and invest such income safely and wisely in those financial vehicles. Make certain when you reach the crossover point and you've achieved financial independence that your financial vehicle at least provides you for your basic needs for the remainder of your life. In order to get into more minutiae, check out the book, Your Money or Your Life.